In 1945, three large ships laden with German refugees are torpedoed by Russian submarines in the Baltic Sea. It's the greatest naval catastrophe in human history, yet virtually unknown. The survivors are few. Most of them have remained silent. Wir konnten einfach nicht drüber sprechen. Wir waren auf dem Schiff. Ich sage, meine Kinder haben es nicht gewusst. Mein Mann hat es nicht gewusst. Und ich habe nie darüber geredet. Ähm, ja gut, ich bin mit dem Schiff untergegangen, aber ich bin gerettet. Okay, basta. Das war alles. There were many more victims on each one of the sunken refugee ships than on Titanic. Why this gigantic catastrophe has left so few records in history is a mystery. This is to be one of the largest wreck diving expeditions ever in the Baltic Sea. Historians, surveyors, and technical divers combine to solve the mystery of these three forgotten refugee ships and look for traces of this gruesome tragedy. An expedition that would demand professionalism, nerves of steel, and an open mind to search for the truth, however painful it may be. The research ship Franklin is fitted with state-of-the-art equipment. Technical divers prepare themselves to film at depths near a hundred meters. Ulla Oskarsson is in charge of the search operation. With 30 years of surveying experience, He's the perfect choice for the task ahead. The group has plenty of experience with discoveries of more than a hundred shipwrecks, some from the 17th century, and they help solve a 50-year political stalemate involving a missing Swedish spy plane shot down by the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Leading the expedition is historian Carl Douglas, a seasoned explorer. He notes, this is a Second World War tragedy long overlooked. As a historian, I've studied World War II and I've studied many details that are, that are not well known. And still, I only had a vague idea. Uh, among the greater public, nothing is known. Nobody's heard of these stories. They were micro happenings in, in a much greater disaster, Second World War. Newspapers took little notice of the events at the time, so the refugee ship disasters were quickly forgotten. In the autumn of 1944, Soviet soldiers cross into East Prussia, an old German province, for the first time. The Soviet army's relentless push toward Berlin results in an exodus of millions of German refugees. In the midst of this chaos, is the grandmother of historian Andreas Kossert. There was no master plan ready at hand in a drawer um, to evacuate East Prussia. The civilians realized that the local Nazi party leaders were the first actually to evacuate, uh, to, to escape, but privately and without actually giving notice to the rest of the civilians. And that was a big, big problem for the civilians because there were no orders when to go, where to go. Thousands of refugees die during the westward march, but for some there's hope. They cram Polish ports in search of safe haven, 
Their only real chance of escape is aboard one of the ships headed away from the front. Eva Rothschild remembers. Man darf nicht vergessen, die Flüchtlinge, die kamen, wie gesagt, über 750 Kilometer zum Teil mit, mit, mit der ganzen Familie, mit Pferden, Wagen zu Fuß. As the overcrowded ships put out to sea, they choose the safe sea lane along the Polish coast. Route 58. This expedition follows the same route. After a day's journey, Franklin reaches the starting point. Carl Douglas's first aim is to locate Steuben, a German liner that went under in the winter of 1945. Many expeditions have searched before without success. Carl Douglas now wants to solve the mystery of the missing refugee ship. It's February 1945. Steuben lies in the East Prussian port of Pilau. The situation is chaotic. Everybody is trying to get on board. The crew lose control and have no proper passenger lists. Patients are carried on board on stretchers and placed below deck. Not even the captain knows just how many people are on board the ship as it leaves. Since that day, more than 60 years ago, Steuben has been lost. This expedition is determined to be the first to find out what really happened. Our interest in, in our group is, is not primarily to dive wrecks first, although diving them first means that they are pristine, and that's what we're interested in, to show these wrecks as they were, as they have been since they sank, and, and to show them in, in their most natural state of beauty, where, where everything is preserved, everything is a frozen moment. All available information has been gathered and studied in detail. The key to success is to limit the search area as much as possible. That area is then thoroughly surveyed using a multi-beam echo sounder and a side scan sonar. We, what we knew when we started searching was that these ships generally took a, a route, let, let's call it a, 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 a highway on the ocean, and generally they, they followed the same route. That data is in itself not enough to start searching on, because these routes are very wide and ships, you know, they, they encounter a threat and they avoid and, and they zigzag and, and, you know, they do all sorts of things that makes it impossible. So just the fact that we knew which route they'd taken uh, told us very little. What, what really uh, got us on the right track were, were uh, reports of fishermen uh, having gotten their nets caught. Franklin traverses back and forth along straight overlapping lines. Not an inch of the bottom is missed. All survey information is computer analyzed and synchronized with GPS systems. Suddenly, a huge object comes into view. The side scan sonar shows a wreck that looks to be the right size for Steuben, but something isn't right. Witnesses state the ship went down bow first, then broke into two with the stern standing up. These images show something completely different. The entire 168 meter long wreck is clearly in one piece, lying on the side. We'd read uh, in our preparations that, that uh, the ship sank in two parts and, and uh, had stood on the bottom, and there were all sorts of, of stories like that. So we were, we were, um, we were kind of surprised. Okay. Uh, we're waiting for the captain to maneuver the boat into position to drop, uh, drop the boy for the divers. Second leg, second leg, 
we should be able to buoy the wreck within uh, plus or minus one meter in each direction. A side scan image is not conclusive evidence. To claim the discovery of Steuben, divers must go down to the wreck and search for details that confirm the identity of the ship, a ship's bell, a builder's plate, or a written name. The divers land on a very large ship, 60 meters down, remarkably well preserved in the cold water of the Baltic Sea. If it is Steuben, they are the first to see it since it went under with more than 4,000 passengers in 1945. Only around 650 people survived. This is the first of many painful experiences for the divers on this expedition. An expedition that will forever change their view of the dramatic last days of the Second World War. This is one of the largest wreck diving expeditions ever in the Baltic Sea. Technical divers and surveyors have combined to trace dramatic events at the end of the Second World War, events largely forgotten until now. The expedition has just located a previously unknown wreck with all the signs of a dramatic sinking. As the divers approach the wreck 60 meters below the surface, they see a gigantic hole from a torpedo hit. We, we, we knew that we were probably the first divers. We went down as, as a whole team together. And, and when we arrived on, on the wreck, we were right in front of the bridge. And just this, this Titanic-like image of this 1920s uh, liner. And what we see is, is, is just this peaceful image of this liner resting. We were looking for something that could conclusively prove that this was indeed the, the Steuben, and, and indeed we did. The, uh, the, we found the builder's plate uh, underneath the bridge. The divers are now swimming over a piece of untouched historic evidence. This was once the warm dining room of the liner, crammed with fleeing refugees. After the torpedo hit, the ship went down fast. Steuben keeled over and everything started to slide downwards. Many passengers never had a chance. They were too ill, bedridden and helpless on the decks below. We see details that, that all makes us all realize uh, that, that we are diving into history. We see uh, on these wrecks, we see elements of history uh, that then come together in, in, in our greater understanding of, of, of history. At least 3,600 people died with the sinking of Steuben, a catastrophe that garnered no more than a footnote in history books. For Carl Douglas, this is the rediscovery of the tragic story of Route 58, a story that started only weeks before the sinking of Steuben.
Wilhelm Gustloff was once the pride of the Nazis. Named for the leader of the Swiss Nazi party, it was built as a cruise ship for the party faithful. With a pub, a dining room, and teak decks to stroll on, it was a holiday at sea. But during the war, she was rebuilt for other purposes. Ich denke viel über die Gustloff, ja. Es ist so viel Schlimmes in dem Krieg passiert. Auch Menschen, die nicht beteiligt waren und nicht. Ich will nicht in nähere Details gehen. Aber es sind so grausame Dinge passiert, dass ähm Eva Rothschild is one of the lucky ones. Towards the end of the war, there is a growing stream of refugees from the eastern provinces of Germany. They are running for their lives. Rape and arson follow the Red Army as it presses forward into German territory. But the Nazi leadership has no contingency plan to rescue their countrymen. Most East Prussians only left home when the Soviet army already was at their doorstep in January 1945. And it was for most of them already almost too late to escape via the landway to, towards the west. Route 58 is the only way out, but the staggering number of refugees surprised the Nazi regime. Um, you talk about 10 to 14 million people who had to leave the home uh, countries uh, or were expelled. So it was in just pure numbers, it was surely the biggest mass enforced migration in recorded history. Millions of desperate refugees head for the last available ships. Wilhelm Gustloff is the most impressive of them, and people fight to get aboard. Als die Leute dann einfach reingelassen wurden in die Gustloff, waren sie natürlich alle glücklich. Es war warm und sie haben sich alle sicher gefühlt und haben gesagt, ah, jetzt sind wir gerettet. On January 30th, 1945, Eva Rothschild is working as a nurse on board Wilhelm Gustloff in the port of Gothenhafen, now Gdynia. As the ship readies to leave, there is total chaos. I don't know if you can imagine it. It was a big door. They just went in there, when it was said, go in, go in. Then there was a storm of people. And there were still over 60,000 people. Late in the afternoon, Captain Wilhelm Zahn decides there's no more room on Wilhelm Gustloff. It's impossible to take on any more people. He heads for Sea Route 58, away from the approaching Red Army. There are more than 10,000 people aboard, steaming to safety. But the Soviet Navy is waiting for them hoping to revenge the brutalities of the German occupation forces in Russia. Mikhail Korobenik is the radio operator aboard S-13, the Soviet submarine that played a crucial role in the drama along Route 58. We went to the sea on the 14th of January, and until the 30th, we couldn't find anything. And when we found anything, Da kam der Oberstabsarztrichter rein zu mir und sagte, Dornchen, ich habe gute Nachrichten, wir sind seit einer Dreiviertelstunde aus dem russischen U-Bootsbereich heraus. Dann kam die Schwester und sagte, Herr Oberstabsarzt, kommen Sie, das Köpfchen guckt. Und da kam das erste Torpedo. Ich 
Те, которые на мостике были, эти же видели взрыв, а те, которые все на внизу в эти в отсеках, это мы только слышали взрывы. Один, один, два, три взрыва. Als die Gustloff unterging, da war ein Schrei von den Leuten im Boot und von den Leuten, die noch im Wasser waren. Und das war, das war schrecklich. Das war, den Schrei höre ich heute noch. Following the discovery of Stoiber, the expedition decides to investigate the sinking of Wilhelm Gustloff, the most iconic of the refugee ships, with more victims than any shipwreck in human history. Rumors and speculations still surround the sinking of Wilhelm Gustloff. The wreck is more than 200 meters long and its position well known. As soon as the expedition is on site, Wilhelm Gustloff appears on the screens in Franklin's survey room. The plan is to send divers down 50 meters below the surface to look for clues as to why this huge refugee ship was sunk. When we started researching these wrecks, we um I mean, I was I was amazed that these stories uh, hadn't reached a greater uh, a, a greater telling that that they hadn't been told in, in more uh, told more. It, I mean, it's a it's a to our minds, our minds of today, uh, it's it's a it's an it's just an incredible disaster. About 9,300 people perish with Wilhelm Kustloff, most of them women and children, nearly eight times more than Titanic. But are there circumstances surrounding this sinking that really haven't been brought to light? Wilhelm Gustloff was described by the Nazi authorities as an innocent refugee ship. She had indeed been a hospital ship, but it is also true that Wilhelm Gustloff played another part in Adolf Hitler's last desperate plan to win the war. Off the Polish coast lie three large wrecks, 
from some of the greatest naval tragedies ever. A specially equipped ship is trying to find out just why this ever happened. The sinking of Wilhelm Gustloff in January 1945 has been described as a brutal attack on an innocent refugee ship, the biggest naval disaster in human history. But some claim that Gustloff carried a secret and that its sinking was in fact the death blow to the Third Reich. After diving, it's time to analyze the imagery on Franklin's instruments. Visual impression, video recordings, and stills are brought together to form a complete mind map of the mangled wreck. The prevailing view among historians has been that the sinking of Gustloff had no impact on the outcome of the war. An American historian, David Greer, questions this view. To him, Gustloff was part of a desperate German plan to win the war. It, it certainly makes more sense to me that the Germans are fighting very hard, they're fighting to the bitter end, and there must have been some hope at least that they could still win the war. And, and Hitler certainly made comments that he's constantly holding out hope that the tide would turn yet again. The Nazi regime calls the traffic along Route 58 Operation Rescue, but in essence, it is also part of a secret military strategy. Refugees are given space aboard the ships, but only on the condition that the armed forces have priority. They are to man a secret weapon Hitler hopes can still win the war. Despite earlier sinkings, Hitler orders transports to continue. They're vital to the war effort. The loss of life is described internally as insignificant. Refugees are unaware these ships are also military targets. Does the Soviet Navy know the German ships have a secret mission? Is this what motivates their attacks on innocent refugee ships. By this time, the German Navy is depleted in the Baltic, but it has not given up. It is, in fact, the last hope Nazi leadership has of winning the war. Until the very end, the German war machine is experimenting with weapons that can turn the war in their favor. At least two of these super weapons are almost ready for action. The most famous and feared is the V-2 rocket, which has its test range on the Baltic coast. The second is a super submarine, a breakthrough in submarine technology that poses a definite threat to the Allies. American historian David Greer reasons this is the prime reason for Hitler's desperate orders to keep the Baltic coast open at any cost. Baltic Sea was of the utmost importance to Hitler and his strategy, primarily in hopes of getting out new technologically superior submarines, the Type 21 U-boats. And in order to get those U-boats out, he had to protect the training and testing grounds for the submarines. So this required that the German army hold sections of the Baltic coast so the Navy could get the submarines ready to go to the Atlantic. The rescue effort in the Baltic is directed by Admiral Karl Dönitz. His overriding aim is not to save refugees, but to transport crews to the new U-boats that are now close to operational. Dönitz is going to do everything he can to try to win the war. And I, I believe this is why he's named as Hitler's successor. That the generals often gave up, but Dönitz is there saying, no, I can win the war. I'll get the U-boats out. The Allies were aware that these were new submarines that did pose a potential damage. And for that reason, Churchill asked Stalin, um, once 
they're getting closer to Germany to take Danzig as quickly as possible, because that was one of the three assembly sites. So that they recognized they were a, a potential threat. Recently discovered documents show that Wilhelm Gustloff had been used for the lodging and training of submarine crews for a considerable time. Crews that were being prepared for the secretly developed super subs. Um, the Gustloff for, for the most years of the war was actually a base for naval training and for, for especially yeah, for, for younger uh, uh, Navy members and it fulfilled this task until the very end and until ac actually the Gustloff sunk. How much do the Soviets know? For much of the war, the Baltic Sea is the scene of brutal naval confrontations, often with the Germans coming out on top. The Soviet Navy loses one submarine for every ship they manage to sink. Expedition team members have managed to locate a number of the many Soviet submarines still lost at the bottom of the Baltic. Even during this expedition, one of them, lost in 1942, is pinpointed by Franklin's instruments. During the war, Soviet submarines are stuck in port for two whole years due to a very effective German blockade. But late in 1944, the Baltic Sea is again opened for unrestrained submarine warfare against a weakened Germany. Но к этому времени серьезных военно-морских целей для наших подводников на Балтике уже не осталось. Дело в том, что Крикс Марина поднес очень тяжелые потери, и крупных боевых единиц у Германии было к этому моменту уже просто наперечет. И встреча с ними для советской подводной лодки ну, была бы уж слишком большой удачей. Приказ, собственно, был очень прост. Топить любое судно противника. With Soviet submarines now free, an indiscriminate hunt for German ships begins. The crews have endured the gruesome siege of Leningrad. Now, they're out for revenge. The entire Russian nation is behind them, and headquarters is eagerly waiting for reports of successful operations at sea. <laughs> The sinking of Wilhelm Gustloff was always controversial. But during the final months of the war, it goes almost unnoticed. Later, serious moral questions are raised among those who do know. Relatives of the victims are still repulsed by the adulation Russia bestows on the captain who ordered the sinking. Now, history reveals that he did, in fact, do serious damage to the German war effort. Several hundred German submariners, all training to man the Type 21 submarine, lose their lives aboard Wilhelm Gustloff. It's too late for Germany to win the war. Conditions worsen for German civilians. In total chaos, they'll do anything to get aboard a ship headed towards the west. Just weeks before the end of the war, the cargo ship Goya sets out from the Polish port of Hela with nearly 7,000 exhausted and desperate passengers. Goya is heading for Route 58.
the expedition has now investigated two of the wrecks that were sunk in what is considered the world's greatest naval catastrophe. When Wilhelm Gustav goes down on January 30th, 1945, more than 9,000 people die. Less than two weeks later, on February 10th, over 3,600 passengers follow Steuben to the bottom of the Baltic Sea. The tragedy is compounded on April 16th, when a third large refugee ship, Goya, is torpedoed by another Soviet submarine. The sinking of the Goya is, is, is all the more tragic because it, it happened just a few weeks before the end of the war. So, so uh, in, in, a, in a war of so much unnecessary killing and death, this was even more uh, unnecessary. Goya lies deeper than Gustloff or Steuben, more than 80 meters down in the cold waters of the Baltic Sea. Filming her is dangerous. Other divers have died trying. So only the most experienced technical divers in the group will go down to document the wreck. We have a saying in, in, among technical divers that we don't take risks, we handle risks. We take these, these dives very seriously, although you probably couldn't see it from, from uh, just being on the deck with us. The preparations and, and, the, uh, and the training and, 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 and all the thinking before the dives is, is very, very important in our, in our safety work and our risk controlling work. We cannot breathe water, so of course any diving is dangerous. Technical diving is a complicated equation that takes into account the depth, the time a diver spends on the bottom of the sea, and the type of gas mixture used to avoid diving sickness. Nitrogen must be kept at a minimum in the tanks. Even a normal level of oxygen is dangerous at these depths. So a large portion of the gas mixture is made up of a neutral, inert gas, helium. The exact composition of these gases is different for each individual. Divers learn from experience. But diving in the Baltic Sea presents an additional challenge. It's cold all year long. And for 15, 20 minutes of filming Goya, divers will have to spend another two hours of slow decompression in cold water on their way back to the surface. Gunther Hahn has spent a great deal of his life studying the last days of the Third Reich. He can recount minute by minute how the refugee ship Goya was sunk by a Soviet submarine, sending his father to an early death. Uh, by the Goya, with these menschen massen, the greatest undergang, the greatest in the history gegeben hat, also stattgefunden hat. Günther Hahn was 12 years old when Goya left port. His father, Captain Felix Hahn, was one of the officers on board, and it was his task to deal with the flood of refugees. Nachher hat man die Sache aufgegeben, weil die Kontrolle verloren gegangen, weil die Leute auch über Tampen, Tauenden, die an Bord hingen, über Leitern und so weiter an Bord, über die Ankerketten sind die an Bord gestiegen, so dass man also nachher nicht mehr wusste, wie viele Leute man genau an Bord hatte. Man rechnet mit 6500 in etwa. Goya is a strong and fast ship, but she's built for cargo, not passengers. During Operation Rescue, she is, however, employed as a shuttle ship along the Polish coast for refugees and wounded soldiers. On the evening of April 16, 1945, Goya weighs anchor on what will be her last journey. 
The crew has finished loading people, leaving tens of thousands behind on the wharf. Those who have made it aboard are crammed into the holes and corridors. Every vacant space is filled. By now, the fate of Gustloff and Steuben is well known, but the fear of the Red Army is even greater. The Soviet submarine L-3 is hunting for a suitable target as it patrols Route 58. Its crew well aware, German convoys prefer to sail at night. Just before midnight, the commander of the Soviet sub spots a large ship and maneuvers into position. 23.45 Uhr erhält Goya praktisch die beiden Torpedotreffer. Torpedoes hit the starboard side with a devastating force. All electricity is knocked out, and Goya instantly begins to list. She goes under in just seven minutes. After the war, Günther Hahn searched for any trace of his father, but he was not among the 184 survivors. Goya is, is one of those wrecks where I don't think I ever forget what happened there. Most other ships I, I explore and, and occasionally I forget what actually happened. And, 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 but the Goya, I think that never leaves us. It's just death down there. Goya's sinking is so fast that many of the lifeboats are never put in the water. People leave their belongings on the deck and throw themselves into the cold sea. It is the ultimate death trap. Three weeks after the sinking of Goya, peace comes to Europe. As the world focuses on Nazi Germany's crimes against humanity, the tragedies along Route 58 seem pale in comparison. The expedition is gradually getting closer to understanding why. For the Allies, it's victory and celebrations. For Germany, the war ends in total capitulation. A country in ruins, millions of homeless and starving civilians. At the Potsdam Conference, victorious nations divide up a large portion of what was pre-war Germany between the Soviet Union and Poland. Altogether, 14 million Germans leave their homes. It is the greatest exodus in human history. A diving expedition on board the survey ship Franklin has for the first time traced and documented the three most tangible monuments to this incredible tragedy. The wrecks of Steuben, 
Wilhelm Gustloff, and Goya, all on the same sea route in the southern Baltic, known during the war as Route 58. These may be the largest wrecks, but in reality, there were many more refugee ships sunk during Operation Rescue. Over a hundred smaller ships found their watery graves as they were chased and bombed by Allied airplanes. One of the very last sunk was Cap Guir, lying just north of Route 58. She carried more than 500 people, most of whom also perished. And another piece of an almost forgotten puzzle is laid by the diving expedition. On land, uh, you know, Germany was destroyed. Large portions of, of London were destroyed. It's built up. The traces are gone. Not so in the oceans. The traces are still there. It's still possible today to experience uh, for us to experience uh, World War II. It's been an emotional experience for all members of the expedition. As Franklin heads home, it's even harder to accept that an event in many ways larger than the sinking of Titanic could remain so little known to this day. But why do the victims of this tragedy speak with such a weak voice in history? simply because there are too many versions of what happened during the last days of the war. And the truth is covered by leagues of water and a blemish on history many try hard to forget. The submariner who played a role in sinking two of the ships has no regrets about doing his duty. His war diary describes the fear he felt and his joy having survived the war. Идём в Померанскую бухту. Сегодня второй раз за этот переход на по нам выпустили торпеды. На этот раз их 9 штук. Благодаря нашему счастью и внимательности мы остались невредимыми. Враг коварен и предсмертной судороги делает последние импульсы для защиты себя, вернее от злобы за проигранную войну. Alexander Marinesco, the commander of the S-13 submarine, is still a hero in Russia. A recently raised statue stands to his memory in the naval city of Kaliningrad, formerly the German city of Königsberg. Marinesco, as a commander of the other ships, was sent to the regions where there was active service германских транспортов, чтобы всячески э, пересекать э, коммуникации противника. Он понимал, что в этом районе может быть только судно неприятеля. Вот, и у него был четкий приказ, он обязан его потопить. Some Germans are repulsed by the Russian side of the story. Historian Andreas Kossert knows better than most that this is a touchy subject. His own family were refugees. To, um, actually, they, they walked. Um, on those icy roads um, to, towards the Baltic coast and then my grandmother was, uh, together with my mother and my aunt, uh, shipped from Pillau to Gotenhafen and then from Gotenhafen um, with the uh, ship Deutschland uh, straight um, to Sassnitz and from Sassnitz to Flensburg. Now that we've, we have dived the, the three wrecks that we're talking about, the main feeling for me has, 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 is really that brings home the enormity of, of, of this catastrophe. Yeah, surely it's a hum human catastrophe, but it's definitely, it could have been prevented if the Nazi um, administration would have actually 
you know, evacuated these Russian civilians much earlier because when the Russians invaded East Russia for the first time in October 1944, they knew exactly what was going to happen. And they knew and they deliberately actually put the German civilians at risk. And, and that, that is actually also the human tragedy behind it that the Nazis acted so irresponsibly. The survivors of the catastrophe are also divided in their views. But by finally telling her full story, at least one of them has now come to terms with the event that shaped her life as a young nurse on board Wilhelm Gustloff. And it came to the end. 